Zembet sano Good Conversation podcast taktamurl namag suka gitig. Za podcast ikan amik ni tuwas pi mongkutu ti mas samit. Za kwa chan tu plok Jack Weatherford di urch ya tsimbaga. Za Jack ing hobtu as mongkut as tu digi atu as ta urin pitsang shinga sa mongkut ak tin os taf chan kitsig namara peste ti namu dara alter te. Za mini hobtu kara Jack te tuwa namu di kan automotiv. Агуулын талаар ярилцахаас гадна мөн анх Монголдод яаж холбогдсон яаж Монголын соёл төвхийн талаар одоо сурсан за улмаар Монголд ирж судалгаа хийх болсон талаар нас ярилцахыг хичээсэн. За тэгээд миний анхны бас подкастыг орлого учраас мэдээж алдаа оноо нийлэн байгаа ах буруу зүг асуулт уу тавих юм уу ам яг хүмүүс сонирхож байгаа асуултыг бас асууж асуусан хэсгээ би бас сайн мэдэхгүй байна. Тэгэхээр тэрэнд бол та бүхэн мөнгөлгөх ваха. За тэгээд олон зүйл нөхцөлгүйгээр та бүхэнд ...эн подкастыг хүлэн амну. All right, so thanks for coming to the podcast, Jack. Oh, thank you. It's okay. It's great to be with you. Yeah, so um, it's been a while since I saw you last time. Um, so I want to start with... Um, so you're a great booster of Mongolia, as far as the way I see it. And as a Mongolian, I'm extremely grateful for that. And Um, the, the talk you gave during the TED conference a few years back was so beautiful. Like, I was so impressed with um, when you read the mini notebook, mm. and it was just kind of very nice and very, um, I guess, you know, um, inspiring in a way. Like hearing all those things about the country. Um, anyway, so I want to start with um, just about. Your, your background, so can you tell me a bit about yourself, you know, what is your academic training and um, what did you do as a, as a young man and like where were you born? And I know you have some American Indian heritage oh, yes. and I want to know more about that and I think the listeners would want to know kind of where you're coming from. I think many, most Mongolians know who you are and mm. what books, you know, the books that you published, but I don't think they know kind of at an individual level, I don't think they know, yes. they know uh, much. Well, as you know, I'm an American. I'm now uh, 71 years old, so I was born in 1946. I was born in a, in a very poor state, South Carolina, and also I was born in a very poor family in the countryside in South Carolina. So it seems sort of odd to me sometimes that I found my home in Mongolia, coming from such an unusual place. We lived on a farm where we grew uh, tobacco and cotton when I was a child. But I started uh, reading books. That was my way to the world. We didn't have radio at that time. We didn't have electricity where I lived. We didn't have radio. We didn't have much connection to the world except through books. And so I started reading books. For some reason, I became fascinated with Chinggis Han. And I cannot say why, really. Also with Alexander the Great and some other people. I was just a boy reading these books. But I just imagined this life with camels, and somehow I thought Mongolia probably had palm trees. And I had a wrong picture of Mongolia, but it was still a very strong picture. So I grew up with this, and then when I finally went off to college, I wrote to Mongolia to see if I could come here to go to college. But at that time, the United States had no relations with Mongolia. Right. It was still the Cold War, and I never received an answer to my letter. And so I finished my undergraduate studies in uh, political science, and then I decided to switch into anthropology, studying cultures of the world. And I applied once again. I wrote off to the university in Mongolia. And once again, there was no answer. So, you know, you just put these things aside in life. Well, it looks like it's not working out, and it's just an interest anyway. It wasn't a burning passion. It was a curiosity and an interest. Right. So I went on with my work, which was mostly dealing with uh, American Indian, Native American heritage and its influence in the world. And I worked with that for some years. And then in the 1990s, of course, everything began to change in this part of the world with the collapse of socialism in both the Soviet Union and in Mongolia. And for the first time, I was able to come. First, I went to Buryatia in Siberia in 1990 because I had uh, read about Lake Baikal and about the origin, perhaps, of the Mongol people in that area. I wanted to go see that first. 
I went there in 1990. I enjoyed it very much, but it didn't exactly grab my heart and soul. Then I, it was a few years before I could get back here. It wasn't until I think it was 1997 when I came and finally got into Mongolia itself. And I remember it so well. The plane was delayed and I arrived very, very late at night. And in those days, Ulaanbaatar was a very dark city at night, just hardly any light at all in right. none of the big buildings of today. And I remember arriving here and fortunately it was dark and I only slept about one hour and then we had to leave the city before light. So I didn't get introduced to Mongolia by seeing Ulaanbaatar. Hmm. I was introduced as slowly the sun came up as we were driving towards the west. And something about seeing Mongolia in the morning with the sun coming up and I was very tired and yet at the same time very happy. And I was seized with a sort of like a delirium, just some kind of crazy excitement and some kind of passion. I thought, oh, this will pass. You know, I'm in my 50s. It's just some old man feeling something strange and all. But it didn't pass. I fell in love with Mongolia in a way I had never been in love with any other country before. I can only compare it to falling in love with my wife. You know, there's the only other thing like it in my life. Mm. And I kept thinking, this will pass. And I was only here the first time for one week. I said, okay, next year I'll come back for, the, for two months. And then it'll be finished. So I came back the next year for two months. I said, okay, next year I'm going to come back and stay longer till I get over this. Well, now it's been 20 years. I'm still waiting to finish with all this passion for Mongolia. Oh, it's fascinating. Yeah, so um, I'm curious. Um, so that kind of experience kind of changed your ideas about the, the country kind of... You may, you said made you fell fell in love with the country. So, do you remember where where was it? In the morning, sun coming up. You know, Yusuke, I can say some things, and I'm not sure if they're true or not. I just remember the feeling being first associated just with the countryside. Mm. On that first day, it was seeing the hills and seeing the the step of Mongolia All and right. the vastness and the openness. And then okay. that night camped along the Orhan River in, in uh, Arkhangai. Mm -hmm. And something about the beauty of the place was so great. And then it was only after camping that I began to see the, the hurting people. They would come out. And at that time, there weren't so many foreigners around. And they were very extremely hospitable and kind and also shy at the same time. But I felt... I felt very much at home and I also felt very much a part of history because I thought of all the people in history who had been here to this Orhan River. Not just Chinggis Khan and the Mongols, but people came from all over the world. This was once the center of the world. This empire, this kingdom, this history. I was overwhelmed by it. At the same time, the cranes were all around in the water and the ducks and a few swans were around and I saw the irises blooming in the ground. It was just everything. My head, I was just like I was drunk all day long mm. and I couldn't understand the people at all, but I didn't need to understand them because their kindness was so great. I remember the first gear I ever went into and they had four daughters and all four were named Tsetsik something. Like okay. Elton Tsetsik and yeah. all. And then only one son, only one son. And I remember they were teasing him all the time and the family was so loving and they kept making more milk tea for me and more mm -hmm. milk tea for me. And I didn't speak a word of the language and they didn't speak a word of English, but we really didn't need it. There was just something yeah. so special. Connection. Yeah. A connection. And this is Mongolia. This yeah. to me is Mongolia. Yes, yeah, so that's how you connected with the country because that was my next question. Um, so you came to Mongolia for the first time in back in 1997. Yes. Okay. Um, my, maybe my next question is maybe it's kind of, I don't know, um, too simple or, or kind of cliche. So, I mean, what do you like most about Mongolia and Mongolian people and Mongolian history and culture? So you are a, you have 20 years of research and 
kind of living in the country, traveling around the country, meeting with people. So, um, you know, kind of based on that experience, so what do you like the most about the country and people and its history and culture? It sounds very odd to say, but I like almost everything. I didn't like everything at first. At first, I didn't like Ulaanbaatar very much, for example. And then, at you first... you think it's better now? No, actually, I don't necessarily think it's better now. I just slowly became more used to it. At first, right. uh, I looked around and I thought, well, the city's kind of empty. There are no cars here. We have these big streets. We have these deer wandering around. And, and <laughs> it seemed, now I look back and I think, oh, that was paradise. That was paradise. I could right. walk down the middle of the street with no problem and the deer would get out of the way. And it, it was a different world. And, but I've grown to love Ulaanbaatar just from the experiences here and from connecting with the people. I think it's hard to love a city, but it's, it's easy to love the Mongol people. And so mm. it, certainly it's been the people that have kept me here. It was the landscape that first attracted me, the countryside. Mm -hmm. That was the first thing. I, I really feel that very strongly. The history wasn't first. And then it was the people that kept reinforcing that and making it stronger. And I remember the first time listening to the Mongolian music and even hearing Humi and Urtingdu for the first time. You know, it was strange, but there was something attractive about it. But I can't say I completely loved it at first. It was just interesting and sort of alluring. And now, of course, I've become totally addicted to the Mongolian music. And so piece by piece, these things grow inside of me, and I keep waiting for it to end. Keep thinking, okay, what more can I fall in love with in this country? Mm -hmm. But then it seems like every year there's there's something new that attracts me. Mm -hmm. Just uh, a few years ago, for the first time, I made it all the way to the Far West. Mm -hmm. and, and I had never been particularly interested in the Far West, because I thought, well... I'm more interested in the Chinggis Khan parts and where the ancient Turkic civilizations were and the Hunu people and all. But then when I went to Bayan Ogi, it was another kind of paradise, a different sort of place. And so step by step, there's always something new in Mongolia that seems to attract my attention and it pulls me in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think... I think it still is um, kind of different, but I think it's a very unique culture that they still have. Yes, um, yes. Yes, the Kazakh people are very interesting, and I, I wish I knew more about them. I've mm -hmm. been to Kazakhstan, and I didn't feel a tremendous connection. I think in some way it's so Europeanized and yeah. not particularly Kazakh in many ways. But when I went to Bayanolgi, I felt a very strong connection with the people there and, yeah. and with the history that the Kazakh people had also played in the past. And Yeah, there's a, a new kind of documentary came out, um, Eagle Huntress. Oh, yes, yes. She, she, I think her name, the, the main kind of the character of that film was um, Eagle Huntress. Um, a girl named Shopan, mm -hmm. and I think the movie did quite well, actually. Yes. Um, anyway, um, so your first book, uh, which is the New York Times bestseller, um, Chinggis Khan and the Making of the Modern World, it was very well received, and I loved the book, and it was so, I think, the way it was written was so beautiful, I just kind of, once I started, I couldn't really put it down. Like, mm -hmm. I had to finish it. Um, it was one of those books. Um, and so I want to talk about that book because you're kind of best known for that, mm. your first book on Mongolian history. Um, so, I mean, why did you write the book and what, what does it, what makes it different from other books written mm. about Chinggis Khan and uh, ancient Mongolian history and the empire. You know, I did not come here with the purpose of writing a book. That wasn't my purpose. And it took me, uh, I think, three visits before I even entertained the idea. But the idea came because 
First, I was reluctant because I wasn't a scholar of anything Asian, not Asian history, not Mongolian history, and I didn't speak the Mongolian language. But then after a couple of years, I realized so much of that history is just unknown in the world. So much of it is missing. And so if I don't write it, who, who's going to write it? Maybe I'm wrong with everything I say, but if I can just write the book and then stimulate interest for other people to write a better book or to correct my book or anything. But I wanted to write the history the way I saw it and the way I believed it. And that's what I did. I certainly had no idea that a book by a person with so little experience in Asian history would become a bestseller. That was the biggest surprise of all for me. Mm -hmm. The book was published, and the publisher wasn't expecting a great return on that book. But within three weeks of the book coming out, although no advertisement had appeared, not one advertisement had appeared, the book became a bestseller on the New York Times and on Amazon. Mm. And I, I was more surprised than anyone. I was right. absolutely shocked by it. That's interesting. And then slowly I realized... No other biographer at that time had been to Mongolia. I mean, no foreign uh, biographer. Right. And also, I was the first American to write one. So I think somehow maybe the position of an American living in America, which is a very powerful country today, gave me a different perspective on the empire. My being from so far away and having no connection to Asia mm -hmm. gave me just a different perspective. I wasn't already a part of a Chinese narrative or Japanese or Mongolian. It was just trying to understand it for myself. And that's what that book was, Chinggis Han in the Making of the Modern World. I was seeing the influence of Chinggis Han all around the world in a way I had never seen before. And I just wanted to express it and to get it out. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it was like a love book in a way, you know, my love for Mongolia. And I would try to just capture the, the, the scenery of Mongolia or the smell of the gear or even sometimes the feeling of the Mongolian language, even though I was writing in English. I would try to use phrases that seemed beautiful in Mongolian or that used alliteration out of Mongolia. Yeah. And it was just everything that I loved about Mongolia, I poured into that book. Yeah, yeah, I think I certainly felt that. Um, I think it was also well researched as well. Um, um, so with, uh, are you familiar with the work of um, Maurice Prasabi? Yes, yes. A Columbia yes, scholar. Yes, And actually I was, um, I've been to his, um, I was at one of his kind of lecture in I think a couple of years ago and then and he was kind of a bit critical of your work like he, yes. he said I think something about kind of your description of Chinggis Khan and his contribution to to the world is a bit exaggerated in mm -hmm. a way kind mm -hmm. of romanticized or yes. and it's not entirely based on facts and things like that and yeah. and I'm just kind of you know I'm just kind of interested like what's your reaction to that mm -hmm. Professor Rosabi is a great professor he's a great scholar uh, he's f fluent in Chinese and he he knows much more about many things than I will ever know and so I understand his criticism but at the same time I believe even now even more firmly, I believe every word that I wrote. If I'm wrong, then so be it. Let it be wrong. Let somebody bring forth the evidence and just lay it out. The readers can judge for themselves. I don't want to change anyone's opinion uh, to force them into some point of view. I just want to say, this is what I think. This is here my research. Here it is. Look at this. This is what I think. This is what I believe very firmly. And if I'm wrong, let some people bring the evidence and prove that I'm wrong. Yes, I make very strong statements about the influence of the Mongols on the world history. But I don't know Asian history as well as Professor Rosabi. I will admit that. I certainly don't know Chinese history the way he does. 
but I spent much of my life in Europe and studying European history, and that was very important to me. And then when I see the, um, uh, the impact of the Mongols on Europe, which for the most part they did not conquer, only a little bit along the fringes, mm -hmm. and yet the things that poured in there with the technology from the Mongol Empire, with the influence of ideas, with the influence of, of uh, these the things that didn't originate in Mongolia, they originated in China much of it, but the Mongols brought it to the world and they brought together a world culture. Yeah. Chinggis Khan united Europe and Asia through a connection that had never been there before. So every word I write, I believe. Mm -hmm. If another generation can say I'm wrong and they can do a better job, I will applaud them for that. But it should be based upon evidence and not just saying I don't agree or this is wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, so your second book, um, Secret History of the Mongol Queens, How the Daughters of Chinggis Khan Rescued His Empire, um, also, I think, well-received, at least in Mongolia. Um, and I think it touched on the kind of relatively unknown part of our history, um, you said in the book. Um, I think because of your research and also beautiful writing, I think we were able to learn about kind of this part of the history. And and I thought the book was very inspiring, especially like, I should, I think every woman of all ages in Mongolia must read it because I think it's very kind of inspirational and motivating for, for a woman because cause you showed us that there was a lot of strong women in history, in our history, and they were you know, powerful and they had a strong presence and they played an important role in, in how the history unfold. Um, so can you tell me about kind of the, the motive, motive for that book and how did you get the idea of the research and eventually a book? Well, it's a mixed motive and I appreciate your, your kind words because uh, first of all, I would say in America following the great success of the first book on Chinggis Khan, the Queen's book did not do nearly as well. Chinggis Khan uh, book had been, was translated into about 25 languages around the world, and uh, the Queen's book uh, did not do so well in the Western world, but it did even better in Asia, which I was very happy and very proud of. But the motivation for that book was two things. First, my wife encouraged me with questions that I couldn't answer sometimes, because I would say something about the sons of Chinggis Khan, and she would say, well, how about the daughters? And then I was looking and said, oh, yeah, well, then they're not really there. I mean, I don't see much information. Then I looked and I, I realized the information had been there. I could see where the information was cut out. That was what was so amazing to me. There's the secret history, this document I had been studying over and over, and the pieces had been cut out about the daughters. And then there was... A, but a kind of fury in me that how could somebody do this to us, to the world, and how could they do it to them, these great queens, these women who did so much in history, and they ruled the greatest empire in the world. And everybody today is very interested in women's history and women's rights and women's role, and how could we not know about these women? Right. So it's this combination of personal factors with my wife and also of this sort of intellectual anger that these women had been so mistreated. So it was a different kind of love to, to try to bring them back out of the mists of history. And I wish I could say I did it thoroughly. I didn't, but at least I hope that just by bringing the names back and a little bit of information, that it's going to encourage a lot more research from a lot better scholars than I am and a lot more people to understand more of who these women were. But also, Chinggis Khan loved his daughters very much. Chinggis Khan, I can look at his relationship with his sons and I see sometimes it was strained and uh, I think always between father and sons that there are problems. But with his daughters, it seems like he always held them to the highest standard and they always rose to meet that standard.
Mm -hmm. He held them up as heroes. And I thought, here's Chinggis Khan, the greatest hero in history, and he's holding up his own daughters as heroes. We need to learn from them. Today, sometimes we act as though we invented all these modern ideas about feminism, or we invented these ideas. No, it was people thousands of years ago, and in the case of Chinggis Khan, almost a thousand years ago, and his daughters, and his wives, and his mother, the role that they played in the world was incredible. Mm -hmm. So I just, uh, I wish people would do more research and better research to make them better. And there were other queens also that I did not go into. Yes. Queen Anu, who came later in Mongolian history. I couldn't go through all the queens of Mongolia. All I wanted to do was put a spotlight and say, look, there are great queens in the history of Mongolia. Let's be aware of this. People, pay attention. We can learn from what these queens did. Yeah, yeah. I think you did a good job. And um, yeah, I certainly hope there will be more research and more work. Um, so your latest book, uh, which came out last year, um, Chinggis Khan and the Quest for God, How the World's Greatest Conqueror Gave Us Religious Freedom. So. I think it's, an, um, I haven't read the book, um, but I will eventually. Um, so what is the main thesis of the book and how is it different from your first book? You know, I think the hardest thing to understand about any culture or any person perhaps, but any culture, is the spiritual aspects. So when I came to Mongolia, it was a little bit easy to see how the Mongols had, had taken Western technology to Europe, or how they brought European technology to Asia. Those are things you can hold in your hand, things such as you know, the paper and, and the compass and those physical items, or how they developed gunpowder and made it into cannons and things like that. It's hard to argue with that history, but to understand what a people believe, what they think, what they hold deep inside of them, it's very difficult to do. It took a long time for me to become more sensitive to those things in Mongolia. I don't want to say knowledgeable. I don't want to say that I ever understood it, but I became more aware. And I thought, you know, I wrote all this about the great contributions of the Mongols and Chinggis Khan, but the greatest contribution perhaps hasn't completely been made yet. And that's in this area of the spirituality and spiritual freedom. Yeah. So I began to research it. And the research came from a couple places. One was, you know, my wife, uh, I quit writing after the, the Queen's book. I said, okay, this was my last book. My wife was ill. She was quite sick. And I wanted to just spend the last years with my life, my wife. And uh, then after a year or two, my wife she often couldn't talk, but then sometimes she could talk. And so one time when she could talk, she said that she felt that her illness had taken away my life and she wanted me to return to writing. She said, I can't die if thinking I've taken your life away from you. I want you to write. I fell in love with you and you wrote. I want you to write. And I thought, well, what, what am I going to do? I can't go out and do research now. I'm very confused. And But this idea about religion was there. And there was one thing that still plagued me from the first book. And that was a footnote in the work of the great Edward Gibbon, a great historian of the, the fall of the Roman Empire. I think he's the greatest historian in the English language. And he wrote in the 1700s, at the same time that the United States was being formed. And in his footnote, he said that he thought the ideas of religious freedom in America came from Chinggis Khan and the Mongols. Well, I wanted to believe every good thing about Chinggis Khan and the Mongols. Right. But I, I just, at first I couldn't believe it. I, I, I knew no evidence for it. And he didn't really give much evidence. He gave a few clues, but not much evidence. And I spent many years when I was doing the first book, trying to research that idea and find some evidence, I could not find it. I could not find it. I could not find it. 
And I decided, you know what, I'm going to go back and look again. And I went back. I went through this and that and the other. First, I went through all the books of George Washington, the first president. And sure enough, he had a novel about Genghis Khan called Zingus, written by a, a French a writer. And she had portrayed Genghis Khan as a great, uh, the greatest lord who lived. She was just a wonderful admirer of his. And she had herself been persecuted for her religion. She was a Protestant and she was exiled from France. I thought, oh, this is so great. But then I found no evidence that George Washington ever read the book. His wife gave it to him. It was in the library. It's still in his library today, but no evidence he read it. So I was back to the beginning again. It wasn't working. I went through one after the other after the other. And finally, I found in the works of Thomas Jefferson. And Thomas Jefferson was the one who wrote the first law of religious freedom. And finally, I saw he was the greatest buyer of books on Genghis Khan. And he gave those even to his own granddaughter. He gave them to people to read. And I saw in there the similarity of words that were used in that book to the words that he put into the first law of religious freedom for the United States. Right. And suddenly it made sense. Because many, well, not many rulers, but a number of rulers in history have been very tolerant of different religions. But what that usually meant is they allowed the religion to operate. But what Chinggis Khan did that was so different was it wasn't just that you allow the religions to operate, that you allow the Buddhists to be Buddhists and the Muslims to be Muslims and Christians to be Christians and Tao. So that wasn't enough. Chinggis Khan's law was more than that. Chinggis Khan's law said every person has the right to choose their religion. And you cannot force them to belong to any religion. You cannot prevent them from belonging to any religion. That was the law of Genghis Khan. And that was the law that Thomas Jefferson copied. It wasn't just to give religious freedom. It was to give every person religious freedom. Then I knew I had to write the book. Once I found that, I had to write the book to explain how all of this happened. Um, interesting so it makes me want to read the book um, even more um, all right so I uh, guess you gave me a good overview of the books and the motives behind those works um, so I, I, I told my my colleagues about you know this idea of podcast and and I'm interviewing as my guest in my first episode and one of my colleagues want me to ask you like um, a question with regards to to women, Mongolian women, and, and she her question uh, goes like this. So she said, "What do you think of Mongolian women in like women and how they are different from other Asian, um, you know, women like mm -hmm. like because you you researched did a lot of research on the strong." female presence throughout the history, but just kind of based on your experience and observation, what do you think of Mongolian women? Well, you have to remember I'm not an expert in any of these issues. I may have opinions, but they're not necessarily expert opinions. Yeah, I guess she just wants to know yeah. your opinion. But I think, I think the first thing is Mongolian people, men and women, they are different from most other people. And I think it's not just different from Asians, but they're different from most sedentary civilizations. Whether you look at the Europeans or China or India or whatever country, most civilization is based upon agriculture and a sedentary way of life. It's the nomadic way of life that makes the Mongols so independent. When they get up in the morning, they're not walking out to the same rice field every day or the same wheat field that they've gone to uh, since they were born and that their parents went to and their grandparents went to. Every day they walk out of the gear, they look around and they have to decide what to do. You know, is there enough grass here? Where's the water? Are there too many flies around? They, they have so many questions they have to answer and it creates a different way of thinking. 
And very often the men have to go one way with some animals or doing something or perhaps off hunting or fighting, and women have to go a different way. And the women have to be just as resourceful as the men. They have to be just as capable of taking care of everything as the men. And that was especially heightened in the Mongol Empire when the men were away for so much of the time. Genghis Khan was away. Most of his, his sons were always away. So women had to take over. And they did it with great ease. And they did a great job of running the society. They had to organize everyday life. They had to oversee the herds. They had to organize uh, uh, the trade, for example, across the Silk, silk Road. Yeah. All these things were being done by women. And I think this long history of Mongolia makes the Mongolian people different. So Mongolian men are different, but also the Mongolian women. They are much stronger mm -hmm. than women in many, I will say, in many of the Asian societies. I don't want to stereotype all Asian societies. But nevertheless, it seems like the women are stronger. But in my opinion, they're also stronger than the women uh, in the Western tradition, too. You look back at great queens such as uh, Adorajan. Uh, you look back at uh, some of the great women who are, who are not queens, but such as Sorokhtani, the, the mother of Hublai Khan and Mong Khan and Arik Boch. Uh, these women were women of incredible power. In any country in the world, they would have had an incredible history. Um, but they all came out of Mongolia. All the way up, as I said, into later times, such as Queen Anu, and, and many other women in the history of Mongolia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I want to go back to um, the religion and how Genghis Khan promoted religious freedom. So I guess before 1990, in the socialist era, religious belief was kind of suppressed and people had to do it, you know, secretly or, um, or in, in, you know, not like, not like today. Yes. And all of a sudden we have a freedom, democracy, and you can follow any religion you want and practice any belief system you want. But it seems to me like today the, the Buddhism, which is the main predominant religion in the country, I think... I'm sure many people will agree with me, but doesn't it doesn't seem like um, kind of the real spiritual, you know, belief. It's just more very ritual based and and um, kind of superstitious, mm -hmm. and it's almost like a business. And what do you think of the current situation of kind of religion? Um, in the country. I mean, I'm sure, I mean, I think it still serves an important purpose, mm -hmm. but at the same time, I mean, I can't stop, you know, I can't help but to actually criticize some of the things that I see in the religious um, scene. Yes, yes, okay. I, I agree with you, but I wouldn't say just for Buddhism, I would say for most religions around the world, the people who follow them to sort of do the, do so in a form of a habit, not without thinking um, thinking too much about what they're doing. They just go along because this is what they did as children. This is how they learned it. I think all the religions become rather debased. They become based on a lot of superstition. But if you look at the origins, every religion had a good origin. And I think Chinggis Khan saw that, that every religion was born out of some good desire to do good. No religion set out to do the bad. No prophet or no founder of religion, no teacher wanted to do bad. But over time, they tend to degenerate. They become stagnant. And they often become not only stagnant, but then corrupt. They become involved with politics and with money and with so many other things. And I think it's very sad to say, but today around the world, I think that is characteristic of every religion. Mm -hmm. And I think in the time of Chinggis Khan, it was also characteristic of every religion. Yeah. But he felt that the law, the supreme law of the state and of the heaven, could be applied, and that all of these religions that were like camels wandering around, you could bring them back onto the path of goodness and the path of the law. But it was up to him as the leader of the state to do that. So he 
recognized that every religion had some contribution to make. Some were better at curing illness, some were better at teaching, and some were better at, at mathematics, that each one had something to offer, and he wanted to harness all of these things to bring them in line to help the society. Today, once again, it's like every religion is wandering in its own way. It's just going after its own ends. And we live in a society where we don't have much political leadership today in the world, that we don't have much religious leadership. People and countries are just sort of wandering in chaos. Mm. Chinggis Khan had a vision. We may agree with his vision, maybe we don't agree with his vision, but he had a vision about how the world should be organized and where religion should fit, where the law should fit, where commerce should fit. He had a vision. And to me, that's the saddest thing about the modern world we live in. We have every comfort, we have every electronic device, we have so much luxury, we have so many things in the world. Mm -hmm. But we do not have the vision that Genghis Khan had. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I guess my la next question, I mean, I don't want to spend too much time in politics. I'm guessing you don't either. Mm -hmm. But I think, I feel like I should ask you about the recent presidential election. And I mean, did, did you actually follow it or not really? For Mongolia. Yeah. Right. For Mongolia, yeah. yes. I, I Follow it is too strong a word. I try to stay aware oh, of okay. what goes on in Mongolia. Yeah, yes. so kind of the, I mean, I'm asking you this because you... I guess you you know you, you know about the country and you research and you read read about what's going on and and I just you know what do you think about the I mean you know, so the rhetoric there was an interesting rhetoric was used in the campaign and and mm. you know one of them won so what was your kind of reaction to the result? Mm -hmm. and, so I'm a foreigner, of course. I'm a foreigner in this country. And I love this country. So I feel like it's always my duty to try to support Mongolia. And I support any and every government that Mongolia has because it's chosen by the Mongol people. I'm not a Mongolian citizen. I don't vote and I should not vote and I should not have a voice. But still I believe that in the long run the Mongolian people are going to make the right choices. Sometimes there are difficulties all the time in history there are some difficulties to overcome mm -hmm. and sometimes there may be mistakes but those mistakes can be corrected in time yeah. and uh, lately we've had uh, two primary parties in this country and I try to be supportive of both in part because this is the only real democracy we have going in this area of the world and uh, we can look at Mongolia and we can look at the problems of the democracy. We can look at the problems of the media. We can look at the problems of the election. But those are the problems of every democracy, including my own country, the United States. Mongolia has not had a problem that the United States has not also had. So I am very thankful that the political process in Mongolia is so alive and that the people take it all so seriously that they are citizens, they know they are citizens, and they're active in their role. Yeah. So I support this government, and sometimes it's good to have both parties represented in the government. Yeah. And so I, I feel like my, my gratitude to this country for allowing me to live here is to try to be supportive of this country and everything yeah. that happens and to always be optimistic about the future and hopeful about the future. Yeah, yeah. Um, that kind of leads to my next question. Um, so the current president, I mean, one of his tactics was kind of the anti-Chinese. He kind of employed the anti-Chinese sentiment and his rhetoric was based on that and I think seemed seemed to work and in, in his favor. And so, as you probably know, as you know, and there is anti-Chinese sentiment uh, that many Mongolians have. Um, and I just wonder, do you think it's rational, like this kind of, you know, the sentiment that we, that we have and display in many different ways? Um, and if so, why do you think that is? I believe that Mongolia is in a unique position in the world between the West and the East. 
They understand Russia very well. They understand China very well. And by means of understanding China, they also understand many of the other Asian countries. So I realize there is a certain fear of China because China is so close by. But I believe that the Mongolian people have a unique ability perhaps to be a bridge among the different cultures of the world, especially between the West and, and East Asia. I think there's an opportunity for Mongolia. Today, Mongolia has no, op, no, no chance of being a great military power. There's no chance of even being a great uh, political power or a great economic power in the world. Maybe the position can improve. I certainly hope it will. But they're not going to hold the power that they have held in the past. But they have a certain intellectual ability to understand. And I think they understand China as well as to understand the West. So my hope is that Mongolia can find its unique role in this. Because I see right now the world pulling apart a little bit with uh, China going one way and some parts of Asia following China in one direction, while the West, or at least the United States, and Europe seems somewhat lost completely, and the United States seems drifting in an unknown direction. And I don't want to yeah. see the hostilities to increase between our countries. Yeah. So it's my hope and my prayer that Mongolia can help, whether it's the United States with Korea, or whether it's uh, China with the United States or China, even with India, because Mongolia has a great understanding of India and a great appreciation of Indian culture. And, and Mongolia holds great respect among the Indian people. So I know political campaigns, they always have a lot of rhetoric and issues that bother people. And I know in my own country, there's a lot of hostility directed towards Mexico for various kinds of reasons. and. I think in the long run, we always have to remember that our neighbors are going to still be there no matter what. Mm -hmm. We have to get along. And I look back at all the, the wars between the nomadic people and the sedentary people of China. And I think about those wars, but I look at it in between. There were many, many centuries of cooperation, many centuries of mutual help. And yes, they each exploited each other at various times. Mongolia exploited and took advantage of China. China has exploited and taken advantage of Mongolia. But those times are much fewer. If we look at the long history, uh, the cooperation between them. And so I hope for a great cooperation mm -hmm. between uh, Mongolia and China. Yeah. And I particularly hope that Mongolia can be a certain voice to help my own country of the United States in its relations with North Korea and with China. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good, good, good answer. For me, like that anti-Chinese sentiment is a lot of times it's irrational, but sometimes I think it's it, there is some rationality behind it because a weak country, small country right next to a, a superpower billion people and it's kind of only rational to fear, you know, there's economic pressure. Yes. And, but at the same time, I just feel like we spent too much, too much energy on this kind of strong dislike towards Chinese people and mm -hmm. it seemed r r irrational and you could focus on other things since there's, like you said, there are neighbor forever and there's nothing you can do. They're so strong. and. We're so dependent on them. Um, anyway, um, so that was, I think that was a really good answer. Um, so there's uh, some, yeah, so where in the Mongolia have you traveled so far? And um, you've probably been to every every part of the country. Um, and do you have a favorite spot, Amak, or place? My favorite spot keeps changing. Because I, I fall in love with one area and sometimes it's my favorite for a year or two. But I think I've been in love with almost every part of Mongolia for at least a year or two. Um, uh, this year, for example, I was up in the upper Orhan River 
up in sailing up near the Russian border with my granddaughter. And that's the first time my granddaughter and I had ever been off traveling and camping by herself. She's 22 and without the rest of our family. So then suddenly, I don't know if it's because I love her so much, but then I started loving the Orhan that part of the Orhan Moor, which was a little bit farther from the history I had known before. Yeah. I had loved the other part of the Orhan, the lower Orhan, for a much longer time, or the upper Orhan in the Orhan Gaina, for a long time. That was a bit, for many years, I went to the Gobi every year. Then it became more difficult for my wife to go to the Gobi until we had to go to places that were a little more accessible. And slowly I began to get to know the area around uh, UB better. Yeah. Right now, I love to be out at Tuohorach on the mm. uh, out near Nalach on yeah. Buktahan Mountain. Yeah. I spend a lot of time there, and I wrote a lot of my last book there. And especially for some reason, after my wife died, it became a place where I I found a tremendous amount of peace. Yeah. And so, good. and then I told you a few years ago, I went to uh, buy an ogi for the first time, and there was a new excitement wasn't just the peace, it was the excitement again. So sometimes it's peaceful, sometimes it's beautiful, sometimes it's restful. There, there are so many different parts of, of Mongolia, and part of it's my own need at the moment. So I need a different part of Mongolia at different times. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what um, Mongolian food, cuisine, dish do you like? Um, um, I know you like... Um, Boats, right? I, yeah. Of course, boats. Everybody likes food <laughs> or boats, but I also like Tsaranide very much. The um, the white foods, the dairy products, and mm -hmm. um, uh, Arud and Etsky. I, I like them very much, and I like eating the different dairy products of the different parts of the country. And some is drier. Uh, some part, some parts they have a with more oil in it, and some is made thin, and some made thick, and I like all of those things, and of course, urum, urum is just uh, almost like heaven. I just can't eat too much of <laughs> right. that. I have to be very careful. Yeah, but I enjoy the Mongolian food. When I'm in Mongolia, I want to eat Mongolian food. Mm. I should get you some Mongolian food then. Um, so I guess my last last question is is about kind of sum up um you know Chinggis Khan and a lot of a lot of what you what you do and what you did um relates to Chinggis Khan his legacy and but in history I mean you admire him but he in the history books you know sometimes he is kind of described as a you know cold-blooded killer mm -hmm. um savage you know just slaughtering people and burning towns and castles and so it's kind of a very negative sometimes his his, his um, pictures in a very negative light and but I think that you saw him differently right and and I just kind of when somebody says oh you know he was he was is a bad man and um, what would you say um, I'd say every human being has bad and good, each one of us, every single one of us. And that applies then also to every country, every culture in the world. You know, I'm an American. I love my country. I respect my country. But look at some of the things that we have done in our history. What we did to the American Indians, we killed them off. What we did to the African people, we made them into slaves. What we did in the wars that we fought, we dropped atomic bombs and we did fire bombing in, in Germany. My father fought in World War II, he fought in Korea, and he fought in Vietnam. And my father told me that he, at the beginning, he felt that it was so right to fight what we were doing. But he said by the time he got to Vietnam, he knew it was not right, that our country was on the wrong path. And yet, I don't condemn our country. We are a good people in many ways, but we've done many bad things. And you also look back and you can see in Mongolian history, many bad things were done. But you have to weigh the bad against the good. And you look at Chinggis Khan, and he was a fierce warrior, like every warrior in history. Alexander the Great, or, or, or Suleiman, or Timur Khan, every great conqueror. 
killed. That's what war is. But you must balance it off with what he did for good. And the Chinggis Han always kept his word. He always told the people, if you surrender, I will protect you. I will not increase your taxes. I will take care of you. And he did that. He would not loot them. He would not abuse them. He protected the rights of women always. He ended kidnapping of women. He ended the sale of women. He instituted religious freedom. He gave protection to every envoy. And by envoy, it wasn't just an ambassador, but also merchants and many other people. Even if he was at war with their country, he protected them. He really gave us the beginning of what we have now is international law. Mm -hmm. So, yes, many things happen bad, but you can say that about any country in the world. And when I judge America in the end, I think that we're still a good people despite all the bad things we have done. Mm -hmm. I think that Chinggis Khan is the greatest leader the world has ever known. It doesn't mean that he was perfect. Yes, I love him, I respect him. But he was not perfect. He was a human being. He was not a god. But he did the best that he could do. And in the end, he did much more good than he did bad. Mm -hmm. And if any of us at the end of our life, we can look back and see that we did more good than bad, then I feel like we had a worthwhile life. He had an impact that none of us will ever had. Never, never. And I just want the world to be aware of what Mongolia has done for the world. Because in the end, I feel that Mongolia has given so much to the world, so much to history. People ask me sometimes, oh, what is Mongolia's greatest produce? Is it cashmere? Is it copper? I say, no. Mongolia's greatest product is history. Mongolians have made history. And yet, I look at all Mongolia has given the world, and I feel the world has really not given Mongolia very much. Not much at all. Yeah. And I feel that if in any way I can just redress that, just change that a little bit, just give an opportunity for people to see what we owe Mongolia, then for me, my life has been worthwhile. That's my mission. Hmm, it's very, um, yeah, very admirable. Um, I guess I'm going to leave you the last kind of comment, if you will. I mean, yeah, maybe um, perhaps it's a very young country, there are many young people um, eager to learn and develop. So what, what's your kind of, if you have like a, a one message to the other young Mongolians out there, what would you say? Well, part of it is to, um, I don't have to tell young Mongolians to embrace the world, they embrace it. I see it through the internet and through everything else, they embrace it. I say embrace the world, but remember who you are. Be Mongol, Hunbein. I am a Mongol. It's unique in this world. You know, hundreds of millions of people are American, hundreds of millions are Chinese or Indian or European, but only Three million people are Mongols. It's a unique birthright. And I hope the Mongolians will preserve that. Because I think Mongolia has more still to teach the world than to learn from the world. I think when it comes to environment, we have environmental problems in every country in the world. And sometimes the outside world comes to Mongolia wanting to teach Mongolia. But I feel like first come to Mongolia to learn. Mongolian people have taken better care of their environment than we have in America or they have in Europe or in China. Come to Mongolia and learn. I think Mongolia's role is great. And on a more personal note, you know, I wrote my works at a time of transition when Mongolia was coming into democracy and opening to the world. and People were very busy making a living and trying to survive. And I was able to write at that moment but now that things are improving in Mongolia and education is improving for many people, there will be a need for a new voice. Mine was only a voice for one time and one place in history. And now we need to have other views of Mongolia, better views. And I said when I wrote the Chinggis Khan book, and I meant it, it's true, I hope there will be many better books written soon. And I hope those books will be written by the young people of Mongolia. Hmm. Thank, 
Thank you. So I think on that note, um, I'm going to close the podcast.、Um, and thank you so much for your time. Oh, thank you, Isuzuki, and, and I hope your podcast will find great success, and they will help to make Mongolia better known and help Mongolia to be more aware of its unique role in history. So I thank you for that.、Mm-hmm. Thank you.